When you think about action car shows, I bet you most people first picture Knight Rider. It's an amazing buddy show with a talking Trans Am. Lots of people have tried to do series around that idea. Even Knight Rider itself tried two more times and failed to bring something new or something generally fun. But there was a show in the early 90s that I think pulled it off. The difficult part about this genre is always being compared to Knight Rider. What can you do that's in the same vein, but doesn't go in the direction of talking car? This is where Viper comes in. The name obviously gives away the car the series features, but instead of focusing on just the car and the driver, Viper has a group of characters revolve around the car. The series went through a lot of changes, but I can happily say Viper got the finish. It lasted four years with a decent ending, but it still went through hell and even cancellation. First, the series was supposed to premiere on CBS. They backed out due to it being too violent. I don't really get where that came from. I watched the show when I was a kid. So it went to NBC in its first season. What drew me to the show was the car and the CGI. Anything that was CG in 94 was like free oh my god. You can't go wrong with the Viper, it's an iconic car, particularly the one they used was a RT-10 Roadster. Its main feature, transforming into the Defender, a heavy armor battle vehicle. It was a part of an offshoot branch of police in Metro City, hidden from most governments and the people. Created by Julian Wilkes, the purpose of the Defender is to protect the city, but not be an enforcer or a weapon. Wilkes created the Viper program from his personal experience with crimes, leaving him paralyzed. He wants to stop what happened to him, to others, but never cause one himself. It's probably the most difficult part about the Viper project. You gotta deal with the police who want results. How do you design a car to only subdue and capture? Wilkes made sure to never put offensive weapons on the car, mostly. It does have rockets in certain cases, but are never used to kill. It relied on various gadgets, ranging from a holographic projector that can camouflage the car itself, putting a 3D image on top, even projected away from the car, way better than Knight Rider 2000's nano skin, physically changing the cab size where it doesn't make sense. Two grapple hooks that can snare cars, a flying drone stored in the back which has built-in video cameras, lasers, and manipulating arms. Its main defenses are the two side-mounted static pulse chargers acting like mini EMPs. Can disable almost all vehicles, including boats and planes as well as the hex snake skin that allows the car to transform between the two modes. It's able to withstand a direct hit by a rocket, but can be bypassed if struck underneath. It also has an off-road mode and in season four, a hovercraft mode. While the car was fancy, what made it different to Knight Rider was the show's original lead, Joe Astor, played by James McCaffrey. If you don't recognize the name, I think you know him better as the voice of Max Payne. While the car was perfect, they couldn't find a driver able to handle it, but thanks to an accident during a bank heist, a man named Michael Payton got injured and marked as dead. Metropol erased his memory and created Joe Astor, a bit of Robocop. This was a risky move, using a forced ex-con to drive the most powerful car in existence. Julian didn't even know about it first. That's how messed up Metropol was. They wanted results, they didn't care what they did to do it. Joe did find out who he really was, ended up making a choice to stay only because of the people he met, Julian and the main mechanic to the car, Frankie Waters. Because of Metropol being pissed off at how Wilkes wanted the car to be used and who they picked as driver, corrupt inside cops were trying to get the project shut down. Thanks to Peyton's past burglaries, they had access to his money, so they were able to pay for a base to house the Viper car in secret. The original cast bonded very well with each other. They leaned into the car's cool gadgetry, but Joe and Julian were the stars. That ex-con family man dynamic butted heads a lot of times. They became close friends, while Frankie was on the sideline being funny, backing them up. Each one got some good stories, but the show was extremely expensive to make. The car's transformations in the first season were so insanely complicated to do, it costed around $50,000 per shot. So if there was like four transformations that were not stock footage, that's $200,000. Easily almost half an entire episode's cost. A little comparison, each Stargate wormhole shot cost around five grand to do, and they used stock footage a load of times. Even with Chrysler's help, it wasn't enough. Being on NBC, ratings have to be really good to keep it going. Unfortunately, they did drop, so the series got canceled after one year. For whatever reason, 
Paramount, two years later, decided to bring it back. I think they knew the series was actually good, but because of the VFX cost was so high, it wasn't justified. But thanks to CGI becoming cheaper for television within those two years, those $50,000 shots dropped, so they were able to bring the show back. It wasn't all roses. McCaffrey and Dorian Harewood were asked to come back to play their characters again. They decided not to. If I remember correctly, James passed simply because he really didn't need the money. It was a few years later. The show was complicated to do. Dorian didn't want to return because his character was limited to being in a wheelchair. It restricted him, so he just said no. Joe Nipote did say yes, which marks him as the only character that was featured for the entire run. His character was slightly retooled. He was still the smartass, but Frankie was integrated into the stories all the time. When the series came back, the writers respectfully explained what happened to Aster and Wilkes over the past two years. They weren't killed off or anything. Aster was reassigned to, to duty in Europe, eventually just leaving the force. Without Aster, the Viper Project was closed up and left inactive. Wilkes left the project to pursue other scientific areas. This is where Jeff Kaki from Space Rangers came in and takes over the driver role as Thomas Cole, a former CIA agent. Unlike last time, Metropole didn't trust the Viper Project to work independently, so they put a liaison on the team, Cameron Westlake, and her boss, the annoying Sherman Catlett. I guess the writers like Earth Elements or something? We have Frankie Waters and now Cameron Westlake. Replacing Wilkes as technical consultant is Ali Farrow. She was able to update the aging card to current standards. The Defender stayed mostly the same. There were a few modifications done to the interior, updated the monitors and controls so that two people could easily operate systems, including remote access. While Metro City was supposed to be a futuristic location, they opted to save on costs and make it look contemporary in the last three years. It didn't really hurt the show. You really couldn't tell much of the city during season one anyway. It was usually shot at night. Each of the seasons dealt with self-contained overall story arcs that ended on cliffhangers. The new characters slotted right in. They never felt out of place with Frankie. Dawn Stern playing Allie was fine. Sadly, she really didn't get much to do. She did a few undercover episodes here and there, but mostly was confined to the new base. Westlake, the best addition to the series. When Joe was on the show, he didn't have much interaction towards the other two since he was on the field so much. It kept Joe very isolated. Westlake and Cole worked together so they were able to build a bond with each other. Season 2 and 3 even got everyone to drive the car at least once. It was Frankie's best moment in the series. Season 2 was about Westlake's past involving her former partner that got killed. The man attempted to discredit the team by making a phony copy of The Defender. The ratings stayed good, but the problems they ran into this time was more personal. Jeff Khaki was difficult to work with, said in interviews. Dawn Stern was not happy with her role on the series, she didn't get much to do, and the car took a lot of limelight away from the actors, so she opted to leave the show off camera at the beginning of season 3. Frankie then became the main car engineer for the remainder of the series, basically Wilkes' old role. In return, he had to worry about everything. Sometimes he went too far, he would go nuts on everyone going on about his tools and junk being moved, it got to his head. Plus, Catlett became a full-time character. Season 3's arc was about the city's gangs and stuff getting tired of the Viper, building up a plan to deal with the car, as well as standalone episodes, culminating with Cole being captured and replaced by a doppelganger getting control of the Defender. Cole's copy attempted to flee with the car, so the team was forced to use the self-destruct, blowing up the Viper. This was not the end of the series. They had plans to build a new car for Season 4. Everyone was all gung-ho to continue on, but between season 3 and 4, they let Khaki go, so they tried again with James and Dorian. This time, both of them said yes, but Harewood was only used for guest episodes. He came back because they wrote out the wheelchair part. He invented basically an artificial spine that corrected most of his paralysis. He used a cane, but was able to walk. They did it mainly because Frankie already had his old role. So instead of having one be redundant, they elected to keep Frankie as the main tech dude. Wilkes came back for around four episodes, first building the new car. Him and Joe were extremely pissed off his car got blown up. That's the in-universe reason why Cole left. He was reassigned. Wilkes called Aster for a favor to drive the car to the base. They were worried it would be stolen this time around, now that the city knew of the existence of it. This time, Julian used a different model Viper, the GTS Coupe and Cobalt paint scheme, to try to hide it better. 
The car and defender mode stayed the same, with some new additions, mainly the hovercraft mode. It only got used three times. It was way too expensive to do, but I will say it was better than Super Pursuit mode on Knight Rider. Westlake was also reassigned thanks to the old car blowing up, but Kat was able to convince the higher-ups to bring her back. Joe decided to come back and be the car's driver for the remainder of the series. They knew this fourth season was their last, so they started to wrap up leftover storylines and give a few episodes to the original trio, with the series finale coming full circle to Aster's past. Remember with the pilot that his original memories of Peyton were blocked? The process started failing, so Aster was fighting within his mind whether to be Aster or to be Peyton. Ultimately, he chose Aster, but accepted both lies and merged them into one. And in standard fashion, Aster steals the Viper to go on a vacation. The Viper program continued on after the series finale. I suggest check out the series. Viper got it all right. Cool action, fun stories, little bits of mystery. One week it'd be about mob bosses, other times it could be mythicism and personal redemption. The show had a few notable guest actors, including Dante Bosco, who played Rufio and Zuko on Hook and Avatar. I don't agree with Dawn Stern saying the car overshadowed the actors. Yeah, the car is the reason why I checked out the show, but I stayed for Joe, Julian, Frankie, Cameron, Tom, Ali, and Sherman. The show would be nothing without them. That's what shows like Knight Rider 2008 got wrong. Every episode featured the car, the car, the car, doing something cool or over the top. But I didn't get a chance to care about the second Michael Knight, and I didn't care about the monotone Val Kilmer as Kit. Viper had a soul. They didn't just make it one big car commercial. The writers cared about continuity, plot, resolutions. The Viper team was the sister show to the Sentinel. Of course it's going to be good. They wrote in the change to the car that made sense. Each of the characters had their important parts to the series. I would have liked if they were used more, Allie and Frankie especially. Above everything, I'm happy that the series got a proper conclusion. It sucks when a series gets cancelled, but please, wrap up your show, no matter how short it is. Show me that you care about your story and not just see it as a thing to be consumed and dropped at a moment's notice. The series is available on DVD, it took them ages to finally do it. I'm pretty sure it's on streaming sites. It's also funny that CBS owns the series now and they rejected it the first time. Thanks for checking out the video. Subscribe if you want to see more from me. Leave a thumbs up if you liked it. Leave a thumbs down if you hated it. And if you remember a movie or a show from the past that's long been forgotten, good or bad, leave it as a suggestion below. I'm always on the lookout for obscured stuff.